Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. Today we're going to introduce a two-dimensional aspect to algebra. We're going to do that by talking about polynomials with two variables instead of one variable. Or as we prefer to frame things, introducing polynumbers with a two-dimensional aspect. We're going to do that in two stages. The first stage is to consider a variant of the polynumbers that we've been so far considering, where we write the polynumber as a row of numbers rather than as a column. And then the next stage is to put those two ideas together sort of at the same time to consider column polynumbers and row polynumbers that will give us a two-dimensional aspect to algebra. So to set the stage, let's just have a quick review of basic arithmetic with the polynumbers that we've been so far considering. We're going to talk about integral polynumbers mostly where the coefficients are integers. We might also call these things poly integers. And there I remind you is the type of the object that we're considering. So there's a integral polynumber, it's called P, and here's another one whose name is Q. And they're just columns of integers, columns of integers. We can write them alternately sort of in this linear form by introducing this special polynumber alpha, which is the polynumber 0, 1. It plays a distinguished role in the theory. So then this one here can be written as 3 minus alpha plus 2 alpha cubed, while this one is 1 plus 4 alpha. And here are the sum of these two polynumbers, and here's the product. And those two written in standard alpha form. And over here, the addition and multiplication is just the usual one that you learn in high school, adding and multiplying those two polynomials together. But the point is we can work completely with just the column of coefficients if we prefer. We don't actually need the variable alpha. Actually, alpha is not really a variable. It's actually a special polynumber. So the advantage in working this way is that it's computationally much more explicit and clear what we're talking about. The ordinary treatment of polynomials that you find in high school courses or college courses is vague about what the actual role of the variable is, be it x or y or t or alpha. It's not too easy, usually, to say what exactly a variable is. It's a, a word that comes from the English language, but it's being used here in mathematics in a somewhat novel way, and different mathematicians have different interpretations as to what exactly a variable is. If you ask a dozen mathematicians what is the variable x, you're probably going to get a dozen different sounding answers. With this approach here, it's more like computer science. We're just working with the essential aspect of the polynomials, namely the coefficients themselves. All right, so we might call these things now column polynumbers. This is a new terminology because we're now shortly going to consider variants of these, where we don't write things down in terms of columns, but rather across in rows. All right, so a row polynumber now. Here are two examples. There's a new polynumber, P, 3, 2, minus 1. And notice that there is a square bracket to the left. That's sort of where the poly number starts. And then there's a round bracket at the back or at the end. That's something that we didn't have in the column formulation, but it's convenient to introduce it here in the row formulation. And that's because when we write things, we usually write things along a line. If there's no closing bracket there, it can be easily confused as to where this poly number uh, stops and say the next object starts. So when we're writing along a row, it's very convenient to have a polynumber with a fixed beginning and a fixed end. But notice this is a square bracket and this is a round bracket, alerting us to the fact that this thing is a new kind of mathematical object. 
It's not a vector. It's not anything else. It's a poly number, a row poly number. All right, so how are we going to add and multiply two such things? Well, it's exactly the same as with column poly numbers, except everything's along rows. And you have to remember that we're starting from the left here. So this is the zeroth coefficient, this is the first coefficient, this is the second coefficient, and so on. So the sum of these two poly numbers is just coefficient by coefficient. 3 plus 4 is 7, 2 plus 0 is 2, minus 1 plus minus 1 is minus 2. Now what about the product? Well, that's the same as effectively what we're doing with column poly numbers, except we're obliged to write it along a row. So let's just check that. How do we multiply these two things? Well, the zeroth coefficient here is 3 times 4. The next coefficient we get by taking the product of 3 times 0, as well as the product of 2 times 4, and adding them together. So we're taking all the, the pairs so that the, the coefficient numbers sort of add up to 1. 0 and the first, the first and the zeroth. To get that minus 7 in the 0, 1, 2 in the second place, we take 3 times minus 1 plus 2 times 0 plus minus 1 times 4 for a total of minus 7. This one here in the 0, 1, 2, third spot. Obtained by taking the zeroth one here and the third one here. There is no third entry there, so we consider it to be zero. So three times zero, plus two times minus one, plus minus one times zero, plus zero times four. The only one that was not zero there was the two times minus one. And the last entry, we get by, that's the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have to look to see here, when we multiply these two things, how can we get something of coefficient 4? We get it by multiplying this thing of coefficient 2 and this thing of coefficient 2. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. All right, now we're going to consider a row analog of that important poly number alpha. We're going to call it beta. So beta is the corresponding row poly number. It's the poly number 0, 1. Then beta squared will be 0, 0, 1. Beta cubed will be 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And so we can write any poly number now in row form as a combination of powers of beta. We'll call that the standard beta form for a row poly number. So here's sort of the general formulation. If we have a row poly number whose coefficients are b0, b1, and so on up to say b sub k. Then we can write that in standard beta form as b0 times beta to the 0 plus b1 times beta to the 1 plus b2 times beta squared all the way up to bk times beta to the k. That's sort of our official way of writing it, and more informally, we'll drop the beta to the zero, just replace that with one, and replace beta to the one simply with beta. So that's what a row poly number is. And we could easily have started our discussion of poly numbers by working with row poly numbers first. So while the arithmetic of column poly numbers and the arithmetic of row poly numbers is essentially the same, still it might be more convenient for certain problems to work in one form and more convenient for other problems to work in another form. In particular, when you're adding poly numbers, it's usually more convenient to have them as columns. When you're multiplying them, I think it's also more convenient to have them as columns. Since those were our two basic operations, it's why I introduced column poly numbers first. However, division, arguably, is a little bit easier to connect with ordinary division of numbers when we're using row poly numbers. So, for example, uh, we saw that 4, 0, minus 1 times 3, 2, minus 1 happened to be this 
poly number 12, 8, minus 7, minus 2, 1. So it follows that if we take this poly number and we divide it by this one, then we ought to get this. In standard beta form, the same expression would be written this way. So this poly number here would be written as this polynomial, 12 plus 8 beta minus 7 beta squared minus 2 beta cubed plus beta the fourth. And this one divided by 4 minus beta squared. And the right hand side would be 3 plus 2 beta minus beta squared. You can see that it's a little bit less economical to write this because we're repeating a lot of these betas. Although sometimes it might be more economical to write things this way because then we don't have to write lots of zeros if our poly numbers had lots of zeros in them. We can just drop the corresponding beta terms like we did right here. Okay, so let's have a look at division once again using row poly numbers now. So as an example of division, let's compute that division on the previous page. So we're going to divide this poly number by this poly number, and hopefully we'll get this one as the quotient. And I'm going to do it in two different ways, sort of an analytic approach and an algebraic approach, and hopefully we'll get the same answer. So let's start by concentrating on the leftmost entries, the ones with the smallest powers of beta corresponding. So we're dividing this by this. And I remind you what that effectively means is we're asking how many of these fit inside here. The idea is we're going to take multiples of this thing and subtract it from here, making the difference simpler and simpler until we get zero. And then we're going to count how many of these altogether we've subtracted. So looking at this 12 here, and looking at this 4, we see that we should subtract 3 of these. So 3 of those is 12, 0, minus 3. What I'm really doing is I'm multiplying by this poly number here, the poly number 3. So 3 times this is just that multiple. And I'm going to subtract that now from the starting point, and the 12s cancel as they ought to. And then we still have 8 minus 0 is 8, minus 7 minus minus 3 is minus 4, minus 2 minus 0 is minus 2, and 1 minus 0 is 1. So that's our new number that we want to subtract multiples of this from. Well, now we look at the smallest entry, which is the 8 here. And we ask how many of these will fit into the 8. Well, the answer is we're going to multiply that 4 by 2. But we need to f multiply this poly number not exactly by 2, but rather by 0, 2, which will shift it over by 1. So when we multiply this by this, we get 0, 8, 0, minus 2. The effect is to first of all shift it over 1 and then multiply by 2. That guarantees that there's an 8 in the right spot. So when we subtract, there's now a 0 there. And we get minus 4. 0, 1. Now how many of these will fit inside here? The answer is this many. In other words, if we multiply this by this, we get exactly this. The two zeros here effectively shift this thing over 2, and then we're multiplying by minus 1, so we get a minus 4 and a 1. That's exactly what we have here, so when we take the difference, we get 0 and the algorithm terminates, and now we simply add up all the multiples of this that we extracted. 3, 2, minus 1, there's the total poly number representing the quotient. Here is the same computation done in a different way, by concentrating on the higher powers of beta first. So we might call this the algebraic approach. So we're not looking at the 12, but rather looking at the 1, and rather looking at this highest power here and asking how many of these will fit inside 1. So what we have to do is we have to multiply this thing by 0, 0, minus 1. There's the result of doing that. Multiplying it by 0, 0 moves it over twice. Multiplying by minus 1 gives us minus 4, 0, 1. 
And now these two numbers exactly agree. So when we take the difference, we get zero here. And we get 12, 8, minus 3, minus 2. Now the highest uh, coefficient is the minus 2. How many of these fit into there? We have to multiply by 0, 2. We're looking at that minus 1 multiplied by 2 will give us a minus 2. That's what it is. We get 0, 8, 0, minus 2 when we multiply this by this. Taking the difference, minus 2's cancel, we get 12, 0, minus 3, which is exactly 3 of these, so we subtract 3 of them. And then all together we've subtracted 3, 2, minus 1, we get the same quotient as we did there. So that's long division, two different approaches, one starting from the lowest coefficients, the other starting from the highest coefficients. Neither is better than the other. They're both completely acceptable uh, methods of uh, solving this problem. The beauty when we're working with these poly numbers is that all of the columns are essentially independent. There's no carrying or interplay between adjacent columns here. Every column is just acting on its own. That in fact suggests some interesting application to ordinary arithmetic. Because after all, this long division is a lot like ordinary long division for numbers. So if the arithmetic for these poly numbers is somehow easier than the arithmetic of ordinary numbers, couldn't we perhaps apply that idea to ordinary arithmetic? So this slide is just a brief aside from our main thrust. I just now want to suggest that there might be um, room for thinking about alternate ways of doing ordinary arithmetic with ordinary Hindu Arabic numbers. Keeping in mind the lessons that we're learning from polynumber arithmetic. So here is a possibly simplified arithmetic that we can do. The idea is to keep all of the columns separate. Well, until the very end. Okay, so we're not going to do any carrying until the very end. So how would that work? Suppose we had to add these three numbers together. I know you all know how to do that. So ordinarily we would do 9 plus 5, that's 14, plus 7 is 21. You would write a 1 here and then you put a 2 up here to carry. Okay, and then you would add that 2 to the sum of these, and so on. Okay, let's do it a little bit differently. Let's just say, well, 9 plus 5 plus 7 is 21. We'll write down 21 in the 1's column. Okay, we'll leave that 21 right there for now. Now in the 10's column, we have 8 plus 7 plus 9. That's 15 plus 9. That's 24. We're going to write down the 24. No carrying. In the 100's column, 3 plus 4 plus 8 is 15. We'll write down the 15. So there's an answer. It's not in the standard Hindu Arabic form because the numbers in the ones, tens, and hundreds columns are not in the acceptable range 0 to 9. This is telling us that the answer is 21 ones plus 24 tens plus 15 hundreds. Well, at this stage we could convert this pretty easily to the standard form in the following way. Starting on the right here, we can say, well, this 21, okay, that's 1 plus 2 tens. So now we can add the 2 tens to the 24 tens that are sitting here for a total of 26 tens. There, there's 26. We still have 15 hundreds. Now, we could do the same thing here. These 26 tens, well, we could write 6 of them, and the other 2 could join uh, the 2 hundreds to make 17 hundreds. And then at the final stage, well, the 1700s can be written as 700s plus 1000. And after you've done this a few times, you could pretty well easily quit, go from here to here. Let's look at multiplication, which is a little bit more interesting. So let's multiply 387 by 594. Now, I remind you what we usually do is we, we multiply 4 times this. And then we uh, multiply th 9 times this, but it has to be moved over because we're really multiplying by 90. And then 5 times this, but we have to move it over twice because we're really multiplying by 500. And then we have to add all these things up, and there's various carries and so on. So we're going to do that a little bit differently here, all right? So we're going to do uh, everything separately. 4 times 7 is 28, and we'll put 28 there. 4 times 8 
is 32. We'll put 32 there. There's 32 tens. It's really 4 times 8 tens, so a total of 32 tens. 4 times 3 hundreds is 12 hundreds. We'll just put a 12 there. Similarly, 9 times this. Well, it's really 90. 90 times 7 is 63 tens. 9 times 8, 72 hundreds. 9 times 3, 27 thousands. And we're not doing any carries. 5 times 7 is the 35. 5 times 8 is 40. 5 times 3 is 15. All what you need to know is your multiplication table. You can do this pretty quickly. And now we're going to add up the ones, add up the tens, add up the hundreds, the thousands, the ten thousands. There's altogether 28 ones. There's, well, there's 32 plus 63, that's 95 tens. Uh, you add up these, that's 119 uh, hundreds and 67 thousands and 15 ten thousands. So that's a, an answer, but it's not in the standard Hindu Arabic form. To do that, we would now start doing our carryings. So the 28 here, we would write as 8 ones, and the two tens move over here to join these 95 tens for a total of 97 tens. We write down 7 of the tens, and then 90 join the hundreds, giving us nine more hundreds. It's 128. So eight of them go there and the 112 go over here. The 12 there would make 79. Nine of them go down and the seven join the 15 to give us 22. Two comes down and the, the other two moves to the next place too. So we get 229,878, which you can verify is the same as you would get the other way. Why might this be somewhat advantageous? Maybe it looks a little bit more like more work, but there's something a little bit simpler about it. And if you have ever had the uh, pleasure of multiplying two very large numbers, like instead of having three digits, it's supposed to were ten digits. Well, you'll know you'd have this column of uh, ten different multiplications, one on top of the other. But when you did all of these calculations, Calculations, there would be lots of carries. And so the carries that you do at each step, usually you write a little number over here. And what would end up happening, you've probably experienced this, is that it gets quite crowded above here because there end up being lots of different carries from different rows of the operation. It gets a little bit messy, in fact. You can try this out. Actually, just take two digits of 10 each, multiply them out and see that you're going to be doing a lot of carrying and that it gets a little bit uh, crowded up there. Here somehow it's more systematic. It's easier to see what's going on. I don't seriously advocate uh, this as an alternative uh, way of teaching young people, but it's probably something that young people could be exposed to at some stage in their um, careers. And maybe it would help struggling students uh, who have trouble doing ordinary multiplication. I think it's conceptually simpler what's going on here than in the standard algorithm for doing addition and multiplication with Hindu-Arabic numbers. So we learn something by the higher algebra informing something about something more basic. Alright, so my real aim in introducing column polynumbers as well as row polynumbers is to put them together. I want to consider two-dimensional analogs of polynumbers. These will be quite useful and we're going to see later on they're going to play a very important organizing role for lots of things. Okay. So we're going to call these things by polynumbers and what I want you to think about is I want you to think about different levels of arithmetic. Arithmetic with ordinary numbers, like 3 times 4 is 12, 5 plus 7 is also 12, uh, that's a zero-dimensional object like a point. Polynumber arithmetic has a one-dimensional aspect because we're writing these things down along a line, either a vertical line or a horizontal line, but a line nevertheless. So we have a column of data or a row of data. It's a one-dimensional string of data. And that's the arithmetic that we're doing there. 
So with bipolynumber arithmetic, which we're now going to introduce, we move to a two-dimensional story where we have an array covering essentially a two-dimensional part of the plane. And so our arithmetic becomes two-dimensional. Okay, so let's introduce these things uh, with some examples. Okay, so here is a bipoly number. Its name is P. What do we see here? Well, we see a, a rectangular array of numbers. Uh, 1, 0, 5, 4, 3, minus 1, 7, 0, 4, 2, 0, 0. They happen to be integers uh, in this case. So we're actually talking here about bipoly integers or integral bipoly numbers. And then there's this sort of frame that replaces the little bracket that sat on top of a poly number. That sort of tells us sort of the bounds of this poly number, how far it extends uh, across and down. It's like a frame for the poly number. It's got little hooks here so we can kind of imagine the rest of the rectangle that's not actually being enclosed. Here's another one, its name is Q. It's of a slightly different size. It still has sort of, sort of four across, but now only uh, two high. Two minus one, three, zero. One, zero, two, minus three. Now, what I want you to think about here is that the top entry here, this one right here, that's like a number. Okay? If we just restricted to the special case where we only had one guy in the top corner, that would be ordinary arithmetic. If we remove everything except the first column, then we'd be doing column poly numbers. If we removed everything except the first row, we would be doing row poly numbers. So now we're doing something that has both column poly numbers in it, row poly numbers in it, but sort of other stuff as well. All right, so how are we going to do arithmetic with these things? Well, arithmetic basically amounts to addition and multiplication. So how do we define addition and multiplication? Addition is easy. It's the same story whether we're doing ordinary numbers, poly numbers, bipoly numbers. We just add component-wise. So to add this one and this one, we just look in each position. The zero zeroth position is there. The zero zeroth position is here. 1 plus 2 is 3. 0 plus minus 1 is minus 1. 5 plus 3 is 8. 4 plus 0 is 4. 3 plus 1 is 4. Minus 1 plus 0 is minus 1. 7 plus 2 is 9. 0 plus minus 3 is minus 3. 4 plus, well, there's nothing down here. So that nothing just doesn't contribute. We only get a contribution here. So. 4, 2, 0, 0, just a copy of that row there. So that's the sum. Now, more interestingly, what is the product of these two bipoly numbers? I think that's a lovely exercise, actually, to, to think about for you. So as a little bit of a challenge, if you'd like to have something to think about for um, half an hour, perhaps, I suggest that you ponder what, first of all, the definition ought to be. Okay. So what should we define the product of these things to be? And what actually does the product of these two things end up being? So you turn off the video and have a think about that. How should we define multiplication of these two by poly numbers? Let me try to explain multiplication sort of in steps. Uh, simple steps first. So let's consider a relatively simple example to start with. We're going to multiply this poly number with this particularly simple one, 0, 1. Okay, what does it do? Well, 0, 1, by the way, that's the one we were calling beta. That thing multiplied by this shifts it over 1 to the right. Shifts it over 1 to the right. It adds a little column of zeros. That's the same thing that it does to a row poly number. It just shifts it over to the right. Similarly, multiplying by this one, which is alpha, takes this thing and shifts it down one and inserts a row of zeros. Well, here's a slightly more sophisticated example. 
So here's a new poly number. We haven't considered it before. This is the bipoly number 0001. And I'm going to tell you what it does when we multiply by our same example here. So what it does is it takes this thing and it translates it diagonally down one. So one down and one to the right. So there it is right there. It's moved to right over there. It's gone down diagonally one to the right. So of course, fine to the fact that there is a one there sort of diagonally down from the zero, zero spot. Here's another example. Suppose we uh, multiply by, by this one here, zero, one, one. And I'm being a little bit sloppy here. I'm not going to put a zero here uh, always. Okay, so I allow my bipoly numbers to be to have little uh, empty spots in it if there's uh, if it's convenient. So what this thing here is is alpha plus beta. So when we multiply it by this example, it really ought to be the sum of what we get when we multiply by this one plus what we get when we multiply by this one. There's the two products we've already done. And suppose we add them together. Well, we're going to just get this one, 0, 3, 1, 2, and then uh, 3, 1, 6, 5, and 0, 4, 5. So this times this equals this one. I hope that gives you an idea of how the multiplication goes. It's essentially really the same as column polynumber multiplication or row polynumber multiplication. But to say what officially the definition is requires a little bit of notation. So let's introduce some general notation to describe these bipolynumbers. Okay, let's start with an official definition of the simplest kind of bipolynumber, which is a natural bipolynumber or just a bipoly number. That's an expression of the following form. Okay, it's a P equals an expression like this where we have an array of natural numbers. Each of these is supposed to be a natural number. And the indexing is this way. This here is A00, zero, zero, then A10, below it A20, all the way down to say AM0, where M is some natural number or possibly zero. Over here, same kind of labeling as here, except now the second entry is one all the way down. So A01, A11, A21, A31, all the way down to AM1 again. Our next column, same thing, except the second entry is two, because we're in the second column. Second starting from zero, zero, one, two. So A02, A12, A22, all the way down to AM2. And we have, well, lots of these columns, perhaps. And say the last one is the one labeled K. So the entries here will be A0K, A1K, A2K, all the way down to AMK. So M and K are rather arbitrary. They're any positive numbers. Okay, so that means natural number or possibly zero as well. If one of them is zero, it means we're talking either about a, a uh, row polynumber or a column polynumber. If both of them are zero, then we're talking just about a polynumber with only one entry, effectively uh, a natural number. And we'll introduce a new type, bipolynum, a natural bipolynumber. And I should remark that this notation that we're using is probably familiar if you've taken linear algebra. It's a very similar kind of labeling that we use in the theory of matrices. With a slight uh, difference that our labeling starts from zero. Zero, one, two, zero, one, two, and so on. That's the same thing that we had for polynumbers. Remember, we had the zeroth coefficient, the first coefficient, the second coefficient, and so on. All right, so once we have bipoly numbers, then we can also introduce bipoly integers, bipoly fractions. We can do the same things that we do for poly numbers and that we do for numbers. 
All right, I'm not going to go through all of that, but let's just make the also additional remark that once we do have zeros allowed, so once we've moved to bipoly integers, or integral bipoly numbers, then there's a kind of convention that we need to uh, adopt, that adding zeros, sort of at the ends, either at the right or, or at the bottom, of a poly number doesn't change it. So 1, 2, 3, 5 is the same as 1, 2, 0, 3, 5, 0, etc. That's the same convention that we had for poly numbers. We allowed ourselves to add some zeros at the end of a poly number, agreeing that it doesn't really change the poly number. All right, so in terms of this labeling of coefficients, we can express a poly number, or a bi poly number P, say as the bi poly number whose general coefficient, whose ijth coefficient is aij. And here's maybe a second bi poly number, q, whose general coefficient is b sub ij. And these bi poly numbers can have different sizes. All right, so the definition of addition is basically component-wise. To add the two bi poly numbers, we add each of the coefficients separately. Now, to multiply the two bi poly numbers, okay, that's a new bi poly number, let's say whose coefficient is Cij, and I have to tell you how do we get Cij. And here's a formula which is analogous and parallel to the formula for the product of ordinary poly numbers. Okay, so it's a sum over K, L, M, and N such that k plus m equals i and l plus n equals j and what we're summing is this product a k l b m n what does it mean so it means that the ijth coefficient is first of all a sum it's a sum of products so we take one product another product another product we add them all up okay and what products are we taking? Well, we're taking one entry from P and another entry from Q. Now, these entries that we're taking have to have some relation to I and J. Namely, the index here, K and L, and the index here, M and N, have to add up as ordered pairs to I, J. This is exactly analogous to what we did with ordinary poly numbers where we only had sort of K and M, say, and K and M had to add up to I. Now we have this pair plus this pair have to add up to this pair. And that means that K plus M equals I and L plus N equals J. Let's illustrate it with an example. So 1, 2, 5, 3 times 4, 5, 1, 2, 1, 3. So how do we get the product? You have to make a separate computation for each coefficient here. The top left-hand one is the simplest one. That's just the product of 1 times 4. This 13 is 1 times 5 plus 2 times 4. This 11 is 1 times 1 plus 2 times 5 plus 0 times 4. We recognize that's just the ordinary multiplication of this row poly number with this row poly number. Similarly, down the first column here will just be the product of this column poly number with this column poly number. So the 22 is a 1 times 2 plus 5 times 4. The 10 is 1 times 0 plus 5 times 2 plus 0 times 4. How about some more general elements? Say this 25 here. Okay. So this 25, its coordinates are 0, Okay, and then we go 1, so that's 1, 0, that's 0, 1, 0, 2, that'll be 1, 2. That's the coefficient C, 1, 2. Corresponding 1 down, 2 across. What does this rule tell us? It tells us that this 25 is created by a whole bunch of uh, different products added together. Okay, which ones are they? So to get this one here, we've got, all together we've got to go down 1 and across 2. You should think about that. That's the coefficient 
one, two, we have to go down one and across two. And what we can do is we can distribute that going down one and across two in different ways. So we have to take products of elements here and elements here so that the coefficients add up to one, two. So for example, one times three, because that's zero, zero, that's one, two. If we add zero, zero and one, two, we get one, two. So that's one allowed product. Another one would be this two times that one. Because this is one across and this one is one down and one across. So altogether we have one down and two across. So that two times that one. Or we could do this five times this one. Or this three times this five. And all the other products would be zero. So this 25 is created from 1 times 3 plus 2 times 1 plus 5 times 1 plus 3 times 5 or 25. Now there's another way or several other ways of thinking about this multiplication. Another way is to say alright what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this thing here first by 1 which is just a copy of itself and then by this 2 which shifts it over 1 and multiplies it by 2. And also by this 5, which shifts it down and multiplies it by 5. And then also by this 3, which moves it diagonally down 1 and multiplies it by 3. So if you did those four things and added them together, you would end up getting this thing. It's a good exercise. So take 1 times this one, plus 2 times this thing moved over in that direction 1, plus 5 times this thing moved down, plus three times this thing moved across and you should get that. There's another way of thinking about this which is to connect it with ordinary polynomial notation in two variables. So I hope you're not surprised to find that a bi poly number can also be written in a standard alpha beta form. Let me illustrate that with the example that we've just talked about on that previous page. This by poly number times this by poly number equals this by poly number. So how could we write this in standard alpha beta form? Well, we think of the alphas corresponding to the usual column poly numbers, beta corresponding to a row poly number. So this thing here is 1 plus 5 alpha plus 2 beta plus 3 alpha times beta. This one is 4 plus 2 alpha plus 5 beta plus 1 alpha beta plus 1 beta squared plus 3 alpha beta squared. Now if you just took those two polynomials, which are polynomials in two variables alpha and beta, that's the usual way of saying it, although the meaning of the word variable is highly debatable. Okay. If you just took that and did standard high school algebra, just expanded it out, you would get this thing. And let me remind you, how would you get this term here, for example, the 25 alpha beta squared? You would look to see here, well, how, how can we make an alpha with a beta squared? We can make one here by taking this one with this 3 alpha beta squared. That's three of them. We can also take this 5 alpha and multiply by beta squared, so 5 times 1 added on. We can also take this beta and multiply it by this alpha beta, so that's 2 times 1 added on. And 3 alpha beta times uh, 5 beta, 15 added on. And I hope you see that's this, essentially the same computation that we were making up here originally without the alphas and betas. Just the positions of things keeping track of things, not the alphas and betas. So the big product that we get is just uh, the alpha beta form of this product by poly number. And sort of the convention here, or the general convention, so if we have a bi poly number whose ij coefficient is aij, then 
we write this in standard alpha beta form by taking a sum over all i and j, the a i j, that's the coefficient, times the corresponding power of alpha and corresponding power of beta, alpha to the i, beta to the j. So this one here, for example, that's in the 1, 2 position. So it corresponds to 3 alpha to the 1, beta to the 2. That thing there corresponds to that term there. And for example, that 18, uh, that, well, let's do a different one. Let's uh, say that that 9 there at the bottom, that's the position 2, 3. That's in the 2, 3 position. So we look over here to the term alpha squared beta cubed with coefficient 9. So we have two-dimensional algebra now. We are expanding our arithmetic. It's really just arithmetic. Okay. It's just arithmetic with more complicated objects. And we're going to see eventually that uh, this actually has some considerable application. It's, a, it's an important topic. Okay. It's something that high school students do see, but they don't usually see it in this form. They just see it in terms of fiddling around with ordinary polynomials. But I think it's uh, a very nice conceptual and logical idea that polynomial like this can be more efficiently represented often by just the array of coefficients organized in an organized way. Not just as a linear row, rather random, all the elements sort of random, but rather every coefficient in the right spot. So we can see the structure of this object more clearly as a two-dimensional thing rather than as a string, as a one-dimensional thing. It's essentially a two-dimensional object, this thing. This may be a new idea for you. It's a very good idea. So let's have a few exercises for you so you can practice a little bit this arithmetic with these new objects. So here's a few little exercises. First one, let's define this bipolar number to be R. So in alpha beta form, this would be alpha plus beta. So I want you to compute that R squared is this one here. 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1. R cubed is this one, with a 1, 3, 3, 1 along the diagonal. And I want you to generalize that. What would R to the fourth be? What would R to the sixth be? And restate what you found in terms of alpha and beta. I hope you can see that you're going to get an obvious connection with the binomial theorem. Here's a sort of a variant of that, where we consider instead this particular bipolar number, 0, 1, minus 1. So then you can show that s squared has this form, that s cubed has this form, same as in the previous one, but with alternating signs down the diagonal. You try to generalize that, and again restate with alpha and beta. And the third exercise, we'll stick with the same S defined this way, but now we'll multiply it by this diagonal type poly number, 0, 1, 1. And you need to show that, that the result of that is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. When you multiply it by a sort of a bigger diagonal one, or maybe we should call this off diagonal one, because the diagonal is sort of in this direction, uh, we get this one, with a 1 here and a minus 1 there. A bigger one, we get one here and minus one here. So check those things out, generalize, and restate it in terms of alpha and beta. We're going to be coming back to bipolar numbers. Um, we're going to look at them even in a, a slightly bigger way. We're going to generalize them even a little bit more. But before we do that, we're going to have to go back to ordinary arithmetic and introduce a uh, very important concept that we've left out until now. This is the idea of a decimal number. It's a subject that's fraught with difficulties, both for public school education, for high school education, for university education, and for research level mathematicians. Okay? Decimal numbers are a major source of confusion and problems in modern mathematics. We're going to talk about them. Start talking about those objects next time. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Walberger. 
Thanks for listening.